Welcome everyone to our PRI Breathing Mechanics in COVID Times webinar series. We are very excited to be here with you tonight and look forward to meeting with you on Tuesday evenings um, for the coming future. We're not exactly sure how many weeks we're gonna go on, but probably a good 10 weeks at least um, to cover as many topics as we see fit in this kind of area um, that Ron wants to go through for not just um, you, um, but also for the general public, for your patients, for your clients, for any practitioners that are out there, um, we want to make sure that we can get this information out to you as much as possible. Um, and so tonight's um, webinar is going to be kind of an introduction uh, for you. Um, and we're not going to be able to take questions tonight, but our plan with future webinars is to be able to leave about 10 minutes at the end of the webinar to address questions. Um, a couple questions, we won't be able to get all your questions answered. And we've also had several questions already emailed to us. So we will continue to take email questions and try to address um, any of those um, questions that you might have in future uh, webinar weeks. Um, but right now I'm gonna turn it over to Ron here and we have a PowerPoint that we're gonna screen share with you um, and I will let him take it away from here. Thanks again. And thank, thank all of you, uh, thank you all for letting us do this and for joining us. Uh, I know a lot of you probably are uh, eating your dinner or what, as we would call it here in the Midwest, your supper. So thanks for letting me join you at this time in your life. Uh, we feel good about the time and we, if this works well, Jen, I think we'll keep doing it at this time. But I thought what we would do, Jen, is start off this webinar series by outlining uh, its purpose. And I am really excited to talk about a subject that is really dear to my heart. I told a lot of my family, and that would be people like Jen and people I work with, how much sleep I lost thinking about uh, this institute, my history, and my desire to talk about ventilatory activity and how it relates to mechanics. So, you know, the title itself uh, was, was a struggle for me. I think, Jen, I had five different titles. At least. And, and I, I spent an hour just deciding on the name of the title because I didn't want to, I didn't want to short change anything and I didn't want anything to be left out. So I think, I really think the title, Jen, summarizes what we're going to talk about in the next seven to 10 weeks or as much time as we need to get through the subject matter I like to talk about. Uh, this is an opportunity for a lot of you to hear me talk for the first time. Uh, there are a lot of people out there who may have never, uh, you know, been exposed to PRI. This is not just a, a webinar on PRI. We're going to sprinkle in a little bit of uh, PRI concepts. We're going to talk a lot about uh, techniques over the years and how they enveloped and how they developed. But most importantly, I think you'll get, a f if you continue to watch all the series, all the webinars, you'll get a feel for maybe how this uh, ontogenously unfolded in my life. So the first one, and I think Jen, they have this, the first purpose I believe is really an important one. It's gonna outline, if you will, the common, this webinar will outline the common postural patterns of the chest wall. And you can go to Google right now and read about, you know, how the chest wall works uh, how, you know, perfusion and ventilation work at different segments of the lung. But I really am going to put uh, an emphasis on what I see and have seen clinically in my 30-some years of practice as a physical therapist on the underlying things that really interfere with arterialization, uh, which is a word for how well we bring blood to the lung and how well we, how well we exchange it, well we exchange it with mechanical movement. Uh, that perfusion wouldn't happen if there wasn't a ventilatory system, a system of reciprocal flow of movement, pressure, uh, being pushed and pulled and, and pushing uh, these arterioles to open and close. And I think we're going to look at it almost like uh, someone would look at a machine and you don't have lungs that operate uh, as machines. They are, lungs are, you know, when we were born, pink, soft, cloud-like, light, airy, fluffy, uh, manageable. And as you get older, they get a little stiffer. They get a little darker in color. They get a little bit more, their tegument gets a little bit more firm. But during this whole course of our life, they are moved. 
they are not moving anything. They are moved. They're li pretty lifeless. That's why this webinar is going to focus on the things that really make us breathe well, and that would be how we move, things that we use to actually move the lungs with. So keep that in mind. We're going to focus on the underlying uh, mechanics of this arterial um, uh, ation, if you will. But I also think if we need a, a webinar, especially in the day we're living in this COVID days, the COVID uh, bacterial infection that some of our clients and patients and friends and families have are no different than the people that I saw back when I was working as a young physical therapist in, in a VA medical center that really had a lot of people still hanging around with these post-polio syndromes. And uh, what we did with uh, intermittent you know, pressure, breathing, and how we looked at chest percussion and chest drainage. Uh, we're gonna talk about compliance. Compliance is a word that reflects the ability of your lung and your chest to allow movement. You know, the higher compliance, the more you're capable of moving. Uh, we have parts of our lungs and parts of our chambers underneath our, our chest walls that are not allowed to move because the position we put them in. And it's a shame because it's, it's wonderful tissue. It's tissue where, you know, it's full of blood and you can't get what you want out of that area for functional activity and things like uh, chronic uh, fatigue, for example, or things that depower your performance, um, all are related to somewhat of that thing called compliance. So activities really complement our, our ability to exchange gas. And, and if you don't have the entire lung uh, aware of that, you start using segments of your lung more so than other segments of your lung. And those are called you know, lung patterns. So the overall, overall pressure, the neural and mechanical activity that puts this pressure on us, for, it comes from this thing called the chest wall. You know, I pulled out this chest wall. When it gets right down to it, when you see uh, uh, a segment of bones like this, you have to remind yourself that everything underneath of that is being managed by the opera operation of those bones as a unit. Uh, they move. If you've ever broken a rib, you know you broke it. Uh, it'll tell you. <laughs> movement will be hampered. Movement will be uh, decreased. So the bone that we're looking at, these 12 pairs, these uh, real, these false ribs and true ribs, have one major uh, purpose in life, and they are to make sure that you have compliance, chest wall compliance, uh, for lung for lung fulfillment and lung uh, de decompression. So, you know, decompress uh, means you open up, compress means you close down, and that's all a form of compliance. So we're gonna describe how to improve chest compliance for the lung compliance through activities that complement good diaphragmatic position. Our diaphragms are put in position by those 12 ribs so that our lungs can overcome pressure neurologically and mechanically. We're gonna go over some of that um, as the next few weeks unfold. I think it's important to focus on repatterning the chest wall mechanics during rest and upright activities. Uh, repatterning means lungs can be retrained. They can't stay there. They are retrained by chest wall operation. And the mechanics that we put our bodies through every day uh, can retrain how to use that, that, that beautiful power coming from the lung. Uh, we are given these, this alveolar tissue for power. Uh, the lungs are, are your power. The ribs are not powerful. The ribs just put the lungs in position to make you powerful. And I think we forget that. We, we honestly, I think, forget that. But when we have these COVID times, we're mindful of it. Within days, hours, and sometimes even minutes, uh, things can go south with patients who cannot fight off who do not have the immune system for power. They don't have the ability to explode. They don't have the ability to rest. And that is all due to this poor arterialization and fluid drainage. Uh, you know, we are gonna talk a lot about the, in a few minutes from now, I'm gonna talk about the smallest alveolar airways in your body to the, to the ones that are the largest. And our goal is to make sure that we maximize all of them. I also think this is an avenue that I can help provide you, the listener, the breather, the chest wall owner, uh, ways to maintain normal, if you will, breathing mechanics by focusing on both 
your two chest walls. We have two of them. And those two chest walls sometimes can work against each other. And sometimes the performance that we acquire by only working one more than the other is enough. And unfortunately, we never feel the, the goodness of having both lungs work correctly because we're satisfied with one operational chest wall. And that, un, un, that accompanying underlying cavity that mechanically massages that lung then stops moving and transporting and lifting and sliding and squishing and squirming and draining and filling and pulling and pushing your lungs around. Our lungs were meant for all of that. If there's anything in our body that was meant to be put in those positions in, in uh, uh, item four, it was your lung. Our lungs were meant to be squished. They were meant to be uh, jumped on. They were meant to explode. And that is probably the most significant thing about the times we're living in. Uh, those lungs need protection. That's why there's, there's a rib cage around them. But they also need the ability to really move as much as you can get them to move. Now, I, I, I'm going to take a few minutes, Jen, and just talk a little bit about what I drew on this, on this board. And when I start off in uh, physical therapy, um, I already had a mindset that the body was pretty special. Uh, the number one thing that I think about uh, on a regular basis is how fortunate I was to be around people that uh, respected uh, pumps, um, you know, generators, uh, things that move fluid. Uh, you know, I worked in, I worked with irrigation wells. I drilled irrigation wells for five years to make enough money to go to a bunch of schools. Um, my, my, my body was always around this thing called pipes. And I'm gonna go over some of the pipes in your body. Our body is an irrigation system. It's an irrigation system inside of your chest wall. And I know, you, I know a lot of you know this, but again, I'm gonna remind you on why we're doing this this afternoon. You know, when I draw these two lungs up, you have these two wonderful uh, or organs that have, you know, one responsibility to move fluid in and out of it so you can exchange gas. That's it. One responsibility to get as much fluid as you can in these two uh, sacks uh, of sacks and get it out and get it in and get it out. That's your, your mode of operation. In and it's got to go out. And when I look at even how I start off in physical therapy, my first few days as a physical therapy aide was doing chest percussion on individuals who were in tanks um, just to get them to move and breathe better. Um, I understood the, the ventilatory system right off the bat. Back. I had a great understanding of cardiopulmonary uh, and my experiences with it right off the bat with people that were missing extremities or people that had strokes, Jen, all had common grounds they were standing on. Common grounds means that their lungs and the way they behaved with their breathing and their ability to aerobically and anaerobically work were pretty predictable. When they get into positions where they couldn't exchange fast enough, you knew it. And for those people that could exchange fast enough, you also knew it. And so when I look at, when I look at these two lungs, the first thing I th think about is my career. And my expansion started when I realized that the only way I'm gonna make sense out of teeth and sight and feet and hearing and sensory input and reflexes is to make sure that I operationally managed my chest wall. And the chest wall that you have is, is what you are, you are given to manage all the other activity in your life, which would be in, including your cortical activity. Because your cortical activity is reflection of what's going on in that chest wall. So when I look at these two lungs, and I get to the heart, the crux of what's going on inside of our body for flow, for frequencies, for ventilatory activity and perfusion, you have to then do something like this. You have to say to yourself, if it was, a, if it was sacred, it's going to be encapsulated. And it is sacred. So it's surrounded by these things that are called ribs. And these ribs come around the body and they go all the way to the front, as you all know. And those ribs are powerful, powerful 
in the fact that they really are the one, one part of your system that has a center to it that regulates the two. And that would be your sternum, your breastbone. So when you look at that system and you look at what's inside of it, it has to reciprocate. It has to alternate. Otherwise, this part of your lung up in this part of your lung, it won't, you won't exchange. You won't ventilate very well. You won't perfuse very well. And all the perfusion will come down here where the blood's pooling with gravity. And that's why there's a big P here on the bottom of these two lobes, which we're going to talk about. I learned that right away. I learned that right away. I learned that if you put somebody in a tilt table too fast, they were going to pass out. I learned that people that couldn't get out of bed in the morning and had to get up slowly, that couldn't pump, couldn't pump because their ribs were not moving. Once we did chest percussion, once we drained that lymph, drained that blood from one lobe to the other, they stood up, they got out of bed, they didn't need a tilt table. They actually could walk uh, for the first time after having a stroke and being in bed for weeks. So I knew the power of blood flow to a tissue called a velar you know, sacs. The power of an alveolar sac is really where this institute all started. So my purpose today and the next few weeks is to make sure that we understand that the purpose of your lungs is to make sure that you uh, have the ability to sense what's happening there. You want to become empowered with that activity. So I'm going to take you through, today will be a day where we just take you through the basic understanding, as I told Jim before we started this, the basic understanding of lung perfusion, lung ventilatory activity. It's not, I'm not a pulmonary therapist, but I've always been a pulmonary therapist. Uh, I don't treat COVID patients, but I always have treated COVID patients. Uh, I don't treat patients that have respiratory distress or emphysema or asthma or allergies. Oh, yes, I do. I treat them every day, and so do you. Because the mechanics associated with those patients, including your COPD patients, are very similar. And that is because something in that lung, something on that lung, is probably not in a position to allow for good, for good perfusion and ventilation, ventilatory activity. So I put a little PowerPoint presentation. I told Jim we'll try to get through as much of this as we can. And we have to start off with my purpose my purpose is to make sure that we understand that the underlying movement in our body is this septal activity. It's layers of activity called pleura in your lung. We're gonna go over the pleura a little bit. Uh, lungs cannot function without slide and slip and slick. They can't do it. And your rib cage would hurt every time you took a breath of air in if you didn't have pleura that allowed you to slide and slippery, you know, work on slick surfaces. The pleura is one of, the, one of two membranes around the lungs. The two membranes are called the viscera and parietal pleura. The visceral pleura envelops the lung and the parietal pleura lines the inner chest wall. Now, both of those are extremely important for anybody who does any type of work uh, with the chest wall. You have to understand you have two layers of that pleura. There are membranes. They, 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 they work with surfactant. They allow you to move easily. They allow you to twist. They allow you to turn. They allow you to do it without pain, without friction. Uh, these membranes follow the action of what they, are, what they cover and are there, are there because, uh, pardon, pardon the misspelled word, are there because both lungs and the chest wall move with or without each other. Now, for what it's worth, I just put this together today. <laughs> so if you find some uh, misspelled words, it's not Jen's fault. I just handed it to her this afternoon. So for what it's worth. If they move without each other, the pleural sacs, which are filled with fluid, for membrane movement, lubrication becomes inflamed. And this inflammation is a real issue right now with the COVID patients, but it's a real issue for all of our patients. Somebody who has been static for a long time and can't move from side to side very well or untwist themselves, and they, you know, they go, go play a game of golf after six months of sitting in uh, a cold weather environment, uh, they can't get out, they're probably going to have some inflammation. They're going to have a low degree of pleurisy. Now, pleurisy and a high degree will kill you, as we all know. Our bottom line is we don't want to be inflamed, and we have these protective things in our body that keep us from being inflamed. One of them happens to be this thing called pleura. 
And Plura is significant in the next seven to 10 weeks if you follow this webinar series. Uh, we want Plura moving on Plura. The space between the two Plura contains this, this negative pressure. It's a vacuum that keeps these lungs inflated. But it also keeps us capable of moving, as I just mentioned. You would not walk if you did not have Plura moving on Plura. You couldn't talk, you couldn't project, you wouldn't be able to reach. So it's important for you to know, anytime you have a convex and a concave surface where that Plura is not moving on itself, you're probably gonna be limited in how you walk and how you talk and how you reach and definitely in how you breathe. The lung, as it relates to physiological mechanics, um, I'm gonna cover briefly. The lung as it relates to physiological mechanics, I'm gonna cover briefly. So we can carry on a conversation about the biomechanics of the lungs uh, with biomechanic influence on the lungs from the chest wall. Uh, biomechanically, lungs can't move, but biomechanically, they operate as if they biomechanically do. And in order for us to do that, we have to understand some physiology. We have two lungs. One is larger. The right one has three, as you all know, and it's, the left one has a smaller one. It has, it's, it's two. It has two lobes. They provide the pressure our chest walls need for postural support. Underline it. You know, it's the first thing that came out of my mouth. It's not that they keep you alive. They do. But they keep you alive by keeping you upright. They provide support. They provide the pr pressure need for shock absorption. They'll salve a maneuver, maneuver so you can push things out of your body. So you can push your body off of a floor and get out of a chair. Uh, they are the tires of your body. They're the support system, but they're much more than that. They, they rhythmically move in waves. And if you look at the pictures that you'll see on the lungs, you're gonna see a top of the lung, a middle of the lung, and the bottom of the lung. And they work, and the bottom of the lung is kind of filled up with fluid because of gravitational forces on that fluid. Uh, it's more airy on the top of every lung, which we'll talk about. But that movement of fluid and the movement of pressure gradient changes happens because of the way you talk and speak. Speaking is voice production. Voice production is, ga is gas production. Gas production and voice production go hand in hand, and that voice is making pressure through that trachea, and it's getting into those bronchioles. Your pressure gradients of, the, of, the, of what's going on in the environment affects those bronchioles. Your activity you select to do affects those bronchioles. The more you stress this pressure system in the lungs, the healthier the lung. The lung wants to be stressed with pressure. It doesn't want to sit around. It wants to work. It's airy, expects to be pushed around. It's not sitting there in a docile environment, in a dead environment. That dead space in those lungs that we're going to talk about in the next couple of weeks is there because of the lack of that movement, that lack of that dynamic flow of, of fluid. So keep that in mind. This is, a, this is probably where you need to be the most active. When I say to somebody, are you gonna go work out today? They go, yeah, I'm gonna go to the gym and work out. Well, I said, well, you know, have, make sure your lungs have a good workout because the, you don't have to be short of breath. You don't have to be out of breath. Just make sure you're pushing something and you're talking and you're, and you're doing some things that really manage and regulate this gas flow. So, when you look at this diagram, and by the way, most of these diagrams, I made this really easy on Jan. I don't know if I made it easy on you, Jan, but I pulled one, one, one book out from my library shelf, and it was by Donna Fraunfelder. And Donna Fraunfelder was my go-to book back in 1989 to 1990. This book's been around a while. I mean, it's, it's yellow and the pages are coming out. But I think it was written in 78. And I, I like the way Donna put her chapters together. I like, because it was what I referenced when I was a young student. And I referenced, I decided I'm gonna reference it even with you. It's an interdisciplinary approach to look at and work with the thing called chest wall. Chest physical therapy and pulmonary rehabilitation. A lot of these figures came out of that book. And that's what I like because it says, the relationship of the lungs to the body and thorax from the posterior view. So if you look at, this is from the anterior view, but if you look at from the back and you look at it, you're gonna see that your chest wall is your lung. So when you say the word lungs, let's just remember the word chest wall. Because when you look at the back of the lungs and the back of the chest wall, 
it's almost the entire chest wall. So when you start looking at ribs anywhere in the back of the back, you should just be thinking the four-letter word, lung. Because if you talk about intercostals, and if you talk about uh, the sympathetic chain, or if you talk about the lat, or if you talk about muscles that go between the two scapulas, it's really not meaningful. The only thing that really means anything is what are all those muscles allowing that lung to really do or not? And so keep that in mind as we go. The relationship of lungs to the word in this title called bone. Bone. So bone should not limit these lungs. Bone should actually facilitate movement of the lungs. And if we have any bones in our body that facilitate movement, it's the 12 ribs that are over those lungs. Our lung function depends, therefore, on, on an incentive program. If you work your lungs, you're going to feel better. If you work your lungs, you're going to cough things up. If you work your lungs, you're going to express yourself. If you work your lungs, you're going to have passion with your brain and your cortex. If you work your lungs, you could probably play the piano. If you work your lungs, you probably could walk halfway decently. And if you work your lungs, you could probably sleep on your left side as well as you sleep on your right side when you go to bed. The chest wall position and the repositioning that you need has to come from how you work your lungs. Uh, your anti-gravitational system has to do with how you fill up your lungs. And your in integration of all your extremities, you've got a lot of them, is all done by how you work your lungs. Your lungs are neurologically feeding you information on where you're at at all given time. So it's that, it's that embellished demand that we have underneath of our, of our mechanical things that we work with that you should be really aware of. And that lung function is totally and solely responsible for how you can and cannot move away from the floor or to the floor. Our lungs have five surfaces. And, you know, I'm, I'm the one that coined apical. You know, I'm telling you, apical is big. You have an apical surface, you have a base to your lungs, an apical and a base for an accordion type of work. You've got a costal surface. The costal surface is where the, the diaphragm attaches to that inside of that rib cage. And then you got a medial part of your lung, and then you got this thing called the diaphragmatic part of the lung, where the diaphragm actually is, is around the, uh, the, the inside around the base. So you got that diaphragmatic chondral side. So you've got five surfaces of the lung, apical, you got base, you got medial, you got costal, and then you got the diaphragm's actual attachment uh, to that lung, lung wall. You got five surfaces. Uh, all these surfaces, this is a significant slide, all these surfaces were designed to move toward each other. They were all meant to come toward each other. If you blow out your air and you compress your ribs and you coil up and you recoil, all those surfaces were meant to come to each other. Now, it's dynamic. If you turn to the left or the right, you bend over and tie your left shoe versus the right shoe, those surfaces are constantly in movement on each other. They're, they're constantly not directed by one specific pattern of movement. That one area of our body where we should have no patterning is the lungs. The lungs were not meant to be patterned. Now, if the rib cage gets patterned, lungs are now in a what I call a diabolic state. They weren't meant to be patterned. The lungs were meant to be unpatterned because they have to move towards each other and then they have to leave each other. They have to recoil and coil. So they move towards each other. They move away from each other. One sometimes more than the other. And, and they move always, always in a spiral keat or a spiral uh, a coil like motion. It's a twisting motion. Our lungs were totally designed to squeeze things in and squeeze things out uh, constantly. So keep that in mind. I'm trying to get in your, it's like a sponge, constant constant. You take that sponge and you twist it. It's twist, this twist is provided by the pattern or unpatterned chest wall movement. Underline that. We don't control lung function. Lung function is controlled by how you operate with your rib cage. The rib cage will control you. Now how you feed and feel that lung with rib cage motion will put you in a pattern. And that is a cortical pattern based on how you distribute your mass with gravitational influences that the lung knows. Lungs understand gravity. Bones do not. The ribs do not understand gravity. 
lungs understand gravity. You were given a lung for that purpose. When you say gravity, you should think gas. When you say gas, you should think gravity. When you say gas, there's only four letters that come with gas, L-U-N-G. All your gas in your body is, 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 is modified by how well you work your lungs. Now, I know a lot of you know this, but I just want to make sure we're all emphasizing the same thing. Our right lung is a lot heavier. It's wider and shorter, while our left lung is longer, thinner, and lighter. Uh, it's just the beauty of the body. There's where PRI really starts. That's really why we are so different on both sides of our body. Uh, they both have characteristics, which we'll talk about in the upcoming weeks. They both have personalities. They both accept gravity a little differently. And they both understand pressure a little bit differently. And they understand your personalities as life goes on. Some of your lungs are a little pinker than the other. Some of them are a little darker than the other because of filtration, how you moved them, when, where they open. When the dust storm comes around, did dust even get into some of those lungs? How you ventilate is all going to be reflective of how those lungs look. You have dead space in your body that you've never used, some of you. And then you have overused space, this, uh, this, this overworked, the swank space. It's overworked. The swank space, overworked. Look it up. So this is activity that's going on inside of our body that we never even think about. We're so mentally, cognitively processing gamma systems and muscle fiber and fascia and bone, that the reality is what we really ought to be doing is empowering and exploding this activity. So when you do get a virus or you do get a bacterial infection, you can fight it off. You know how to fight it off. So the chief physiological purpose of our lungs is to arterialize blood. That's it. That's our chief reason why we have them. In addition to putting us up on two feet, our lungs reflect our mammalian build. And so arterialization is a, conver is a conversion of venous blood into arterial blood by and through the absorption of oxygen into the lungs. I know a lot of you know that, but let's just remember that gravity is related to how we absorb oxygen. If we don't absorb oxygen, we can't handle gravity. We can't handle power. How you absorb that oxygen is how you're going to work. And how you work is how you're going to burn off calories. So the biggest diet you can put somebody on is maximize arterialization. And maximize arterialization means you better have ribs that will expand and explode anytime you want them to. In its importance, in its importance, the ventilation system usually is not really that well discussed, in my opinion. It's probably the most important thing we can discuss because it comes in, it's the contact, it has to be in contact with areas that are perfusing. So when you breathe in, there's got to be blood there. If you don't put blood there, your breath is worthless. So wherever you put blood, whatever position you choose with a PRI technique, let's put some blood there. And that's what we're going to do with some of these techniques. We're going to make sure you understand the top 10 PRI breathing techniques, COVID techniques, techniques that put blood in a position to maximize perfusion. Otherwise, what you're doing is you're putting people in position and you're not reducing dead space and you're not increasing perfusion. So we're going to tie the two together over the next few weeks. Conditions that alter the ventilatory system or perfusion, perfusion of the, or a part of the lungs will also affect your gas exchange in that portion of the lung. And again, that's what this is really all about. How do we reportion our lungs? How do we reportion them? Not repattern them, because you can't be repatterned if you don't reposition ribs. But once you reposition ribs, now you're reportioning portions of the lung that you didn't have before. And your rib cage may actually kind of like it because your mood may change. You may have them, some things going on that you didn't realize you could do until you reportioned that part of your lung. Uneven ventilation occurs when there is uneven airway resistance. And uneven airway resistance or uneven compliance is in, in different parts of the lung all has to do with your portion of the lung you're working with, the position of the lung you're working with, the place that you put your lung, and the pattern that's on the outside of it. Those are all big P words in the area of this areas of PRI. Uh, it's uneven. It's asymmetrical. We have an asymmetrical body for even ventilatory activity.
We have a liver under one lung. We've got a heart and one under the other lung. We've got a stomach in between. That was all beautifully designed for even ventilatory activity. Uneven ventilatory activity comes from when we choose to use one lung more for function because the operation that we are going through doesn't demand anything from the other lung. Uneven airway resistance may be due to airway narrowing over time, you know, bronchial constriction, asthmatics, the top leading lung dysfunctional state in the United States right now is not COVID, it's asthma and allergies. And it's been going on for years. And it's gonna take a disease, it's gonna take this thing called COVID to help us understand lungs. But you know, allergies are growing so fast. A lot of these individuals that can't fight this bacteria also are allergic to something. They get little mucus plugs in their sacs. They become edematous, inflammation, and they swell up. And then when you have that happen, usually there's collapse somewhere in that system. And when that collapse occurs, you get emphysema. And now you don't even have good lung tissue anymore to reportion. The lungs may also expand unevenly as a result of effects of gravitational position. Patterning, gravitational positional patterning. Gravitational position patterning. Standing on one leg more so than the other. Using one arm more so than the other. Tipping your head one direction more so than the other. Using one eye for distance more so than the other. Using a hearing aid on one side more so than the other. Whatever that gravitational position of patterning you have, whatever shoe you wear out first, is gonna have an impact on that uneven effect the lung has on how you handle gravita gravity and and, and gas exchange. Fibrosis, emphysema, pleural thickening, secondary to limited pleural movement. Underline that, pleural thickening, secondary to limited pleural movement. Pleura gets thick when pleura doesn't move. <laughs> it's important. I've seen it so many times. I worked with all these for, I think, Jan, maybe 13, 14, 15 years in a, uh, as a director of a occupational physical therapy, speech therapy, uh, outpatient, inpatient hospital setting. We ran a burn unit. I ran a burn unit for fit with physical therapists going in that unit. And I, sp I spent hours taking dead skin off of alive bodies. And these individuals, we knew our number one problem was keep the lungs healthy. Don't let those pleura, don't let that pleura get thick. Uh, I could tell you stories that'll make your hair fall out. It wasn't the burn that we were worried about, the skin. We were worried about the lungs. Were they damaged? Did they get scarred? Did they, are they gonna become fibrotic? Lungs, lung tissue becomes fibrotic when you don't use it when, it, when it isn't moving because it becomes thick. And when it becomes thick, then you don't move. You can see thick lungs when you see thick people. When you see thick people not moving, swinging their arms, you might just call them pleuretic because they're not moving enough. They're not getting that, 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 that flow that we talked about earlier in this talk. That leads to effusion and that usually always leads to pulmonary edema. So keep in mind, that's a major important slide. I wrote that this morning. I just wanna make sure you understand that's history. I see it, I still see it today. I see young kids today with some of that because they don't move, they don't climb, they don't know how to get that unrestricted part of their lung to escape, to open up, and they become gelled up. Ventil ventilation is the exchange of, of this airway, of air in this airway between the lungs and the atmosphere so that oxygen can be exchanged for carbon dioxide. In the alveolar and these tiny little air sacs in the lungs. Perfusion is a passage of fluid through those tiny little areas of the lung through this circulatory system, through a capillary bed in the tissue of the lung. The air, that's perfusion. So keep that in mind. Perfusion is the passage of fluid. Keep that in mind. Ventilation is the exchange of air. Let's make a mental note of that, Jen. Ventilation is the exchange of air. Perfu perfusion is the pas passage of fluid. For you to arterialize, you have to have both in the same area. Anything that's gonna take away your V, or your pee in that area is a dead type of lung. It's there, but it's not really exchanging much. Our goal is to keep as much ventilatory activity as we can 
and as much perfusion as we can. We need perfusion in the upper, upper apical aspects of our lungs, and we need more ventilation on the bottom because pooling occurs with, with the bottom of our lungs. The peas are bigger down here than they are up here. The areas of the best gas exchange will occur where there is the greatest amount of perfusion and ventilation. That's right in the middle. That's right in the middle of your lungs, right smack in the middle, right around this thing called the sternum. The sternum is where the areas of best gas exchange will occur. And anything above and below that that you can continue the perfusion of ventilation is a, is a gift. And so anytime you lose your zones of apposition or you, your ribs start to pile up in the air and your backs become straight and your necks are become overworked, you know that the perfusion is still going to be safely provided to you by that sternal area. But you lost it down here now because everything's flipped up. There's not good exchange because the poor ventilatory system isn't working anymore down there. It's dead. And this up here on the top part, it's collapsing down. And for those people who have taken any of our PRI courses, the posture respiration course, you'll understand that. So when you see flared ribs and you see ribs that are not moving and you see ribs that are really uh, close to each other from the anterior to the posterior aspects of the chest wall, you know that the only real perfusion you've got going on is right around the bronchioles, right around these, these trunks that go into your lung. That's about it. And those people are usually sooner or later going to be on oxygen chambers. So the sternum does keep us safe for a lot of reasons. Ventilation is one of those reasons. The, this occurs towards the base of the lungs in, the, in, in erect humans. Most of our perfusion occurs down here, as I said earlier. I love this slide in our book. It's, I think, figure 2-7. You can see by looking at that slide down here, you've got this arterial supply that's bigger down here than up here. These sacs are bigger up here, but the arterial supply is not as good. PRI professionals and movement specialists will figure out very shortly in life how important it is to keep apical expansion. Because if you lose apical expansion, you're losing a significant amount of power from this, this need to pump blood up into that area. If this uh, part of your lung doesn't have the ability to ventilate, ventilate. Perfusion will occur down here real easily by doing nothing. The blood just drops down into your lower lungs and you swish around a little bit and you'll get some gas exchanged. But you're never going to get it up here in the top part of your lung if you don't start swinging your arms. You don't start swinging those ribs. You don't start moving your ribs from side to side and jump up and down on a trampoline once in a while called your pelvic floor. These diaphragms were made to pump. So arm swings, arm swings and leg swings push blood from here all the way up to here. Otherwise, it doesn't get up here. And after a while, you'll start seeing shoulders hang down on one side or both sides, ribs collapsing in and ribs then pushed out because there is no ventilatory perfusion going on, no ventilation in the lower part of your body, and no perfusion in the upper. You're basically out of breath before you even get up. You pass out. You become dysautonomic lightheaded, disoriented, and you know, very fatigued. Over time, changes in the posture secondary to positions of ease and comfort will interfere with your de developing the perfusion. And these are called habits. They're patterns that changes both your ventilatory positions and your ability to perfuse. And that then has a major impact on your arterialization patterns of, of how you breathe and how you work. I love this slide too. There are three zones that Donna put up for us, zone one, zone two, and zone three. And if you look at that, zone one has perfusion in excess of ventilation. That would be up here. Zone two has what we call a pretty good range of, your odds are it's gonna be pretty one-to-one. -one. Perfusion and ventilation right around that sternum is one-to-one. -one. And it probably will be one-to-one -one most of your life if it did nothing. If you laid in bed all day, it's gonna be probably one-to-one -one in zone two. But zone three is where most of your ventilation occurs in excess of perfusion. Lots of perfusion down here. That's why when you lose your abdominal wall, I saw Donna up there, Donna Byrne, when you lose your abdominal wall, Donna, that area down here in your lower part of your lungs is lost. 
So now your ability to really do something about that plotting program it will be lost if you can't get that P balanced out with that V. The more we ventilate down here and breathe and talk while we do our Pilates, the better that V is going to grow and the P is going to get smaller because it'll become more one-to-one. -one. Our goal is to make a zone two down here where there's a zone three and a zone two where there's a zone one. I like to think the Postural Restoration Institute has that in mind. And by the way, it does, because over the next few weeks, I'm going to take you through it. I'm going to make sure you know how we make zone ones and threes zone twos on both sides of your body. Activities that change gravitational position will have an influence on, the, on greater gas exchange occurring toward the gravity dependent areas. We don't want to be gravity dependent on one side. We forgot how to get gravity dependent on this left side. We're too gravity dependent on the right side, partially because where our organs are, but partially because we were developed that way. We have a, a side that we naturally want to go to. The unnatural side will move us over there if we can take and do everything possible by taking our lungs and the, uh, the chest wall and just get them to beat back and forth. Get them to move back and forth. Once they start moving back and forth, this lung will feed that ventilatory activity. And that ventilatory will feed this perfusion. And this perfusion will feed that perfusion. So don't let the size of the lungs bother you. You'll even out the perfusion, the ventilation, if you alternate that activity. If you don't alternate that activity, you'll see a big lung over here collapse, and you'll see a little lung over here open up. But it's not really good even ventilatory activity. It wasn't designed that way. Both of our sides of our lungs were designed to work with each other. And the diaphragm that does that is the diaphragm that's connected by the rib cage. You have two of those leaflets too. So for example, activities that are used to enhance integration of these senses and extremities can be influenced by the position one, plus, one places the lobes of the lungs in for gravitational assistance. In our institute, we put a lot of people uh, on the left side for gravitational system assistance for that reason. The more gravitational assistance you can get on that left lung, the more both lungs are happy. Er. So just keep that in mind as we go through the next few weeks. A person lying on his or her side will therefore always have greater gas exchange in the bottom lung. And this is why you have pictures like this and you know, positional issues where you see the darkness in the lungs, that's where there's better perfusion. That's where the blood is flowing. But again, it's innate, it's not active. It's just where do you wanna put a static body for perfusion? All three of those positions can be done with activities very easily. All three of them can be done with activities. It's called forward locomotion. It's called singing. It's called kicking and jumping. It's called climbing. All of those positions you see on that page can happen in an activity, provided the trunk is moving horizontally, vertically, laterally, and rotating. It all can happen, but you've got to have arms and legs that are going to let it happen. Chest wall biomechanical influences on pleura and lung position and pattern function are just going to be briefly discussed. And I think, what do I got, about 15 minutes left? Remember, the flow of air into the lung is a result of pressure differences between the lungs and the atmosphere. That's what's really important. When I see chest walls that are asymmetrical in nature, where I know that the right lung is starting to become narrower, flatter on the outside, and it's dropping down, and the left lung is flaring up as if individual, individuals were standing on one side. I know the flow of air into that lung is a result of pressure differences between the lungs and the atmosphere around it. I know the pressure in this lung and that lung is reflected, reflective of the pressure around it that's lost because the rib cage dynamics that didn't balance out that pressure around it. Uh, there's a storm coming in on this side of the lung. The atmosphere of pressure on that side is really light, but the atmosphere pressure on this side is really heavy. The compliance is high over here, and this is a non-compliant lung. There's a storm brewing up because there's gonna be a, a shift in the wind. There's a cold front on one side and a warm front on the other. I'm trying to get in your minds because that's the storms I see in this prairie. That's the storm that I see in this environment. 
unequal pressure, unequal atmospheric pressure on the outside of the body provided by the rib cage re, does not allow the pressure gradient inside that lung to stay even on both sides. Over time, that storm stays there. It's called patterning. In you know, TRI terms, it's called a left AIC, right BC storm. It's been brewing and it's been patterned now for it to rain always over, over here in Seattle and be sunny down here in Arizona all the time. Because that's how the wave of air atmospheric pressure, that's how it moves across the United States. That's how it moves across that continent. It's a pattern of wind, a pattern of wind. Write that down. Lungs work around patterns of wind flow. Wind flow is regulated by mountains and by flat prairies. Wherever there's a mountain, there's gonna be turbulence. Wherever there's flat prairies, there's gonna be straight wind. And that's what I see when I look at these, these two sets of lungs. To keep them even, to keep everything level, they both gotta have a little mountain and they both gotta have a little flatness. At any time they need it, they've gotta move up and down on each other. They gotta push up, they gotta come down. They gotta push up, they gotta come down. Otherwise, normal breathing isn't gonna happen and the inspiration for that to occur and, and the alveolar pressure that goes with it will be undesirable. In normal breathing for inspiration to occur, alveolar pressure must be less than atmospheric pressure. End of note. If you really wanna work with a human that's gonna do well for you, you have to have that bullet. Inspiration has to have alveolar pressure that has to be less than the atmospheric pressure, otherwise your chest can't expand and you collapse. Chest walls become sunken in, as you all know. Scoliosis of the back occurs on one side. You start to collapse. When that is reversed, you collapse. Muscular contraction of the respiratory muscles lowers alveolar pressure and enlarges the chest wall wherever and whenever it can. Muscular contraction of the respiratory muscles, that would be your intercostals and your diaphragm, lowers the alveolar pressure and enlarges the chest wall whenever possible. The number one respiratory muscle that does that is the best postural atmospheric muscle you've got called the diaphragm. And you've got two of them. And if you don't have them in the right position, that third bullet is going to interfere with lung health, period. Exhalation occurs when alveolar pressure is greater than atmospheric pressure. As the chest wall recoils, relaxes, the inter intercostals contract. So now the last slide was about inhalation. This is about exhalation. Exhalation occurs when the alveolar pressure is greater than the atmospheric pressure as the chest wall recoils, relaxes to its pre-inhalation state. Exhalation can also be limited because of the chest wall's inability to compress the lungs. What's the number one thing that's gonna limit your ability to compress the lungs? Reportion needs, portions that are out of place, placement that's bad because of bad position. People that don't move, how, move their masses from one side to the other. They don't understand the influences of gravity. They're afraid of gravity. So exhalation therefore can be limited because of your chest wall's compliance to gravity, to acceptance of gravity. And that's necessary for you to compress those lungs. That would be things like this. Leaning constantly, listing constantly, laying constantly to one side limits both exhalation and inhalation mechanics of some part of the chest wall. And that's what you see here. There's something going on that's limiting that chest wall because of the way that individual leans and then compensates by listing or has to lay down. The most common site of limitation is the right anterior apical lobe. It's the most common site of the, what we're talking about of limitation and the left posterior base, left posterior base lobe. This lobe back here and this lobe up here are the most common sites of limited lung function. Research up the wazoo on this. So the human pattern is pretty predictable when the limitation of the lung wall in these two areas exists. I wanna give you some numbers, Jan. I think I've got some time to do this. I hope I do. This was a, this is a, in Donna's book. 
you all have one trait here. You have two main bronchi. You have eight lobar bronchi. You have 16 segmental bronchi. You have 2,000 small bronchi. 2,000 small bronchi. You have 500,000 respiratory bronchioles. And you have 8 million alveolar sacs. And each alveolar sac has 17 alveolar, each alveolar sac contains approximately 17 alveolar uh, 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 sacs in it. The average human adult, the average human adult man has over 300 million alveoli in their body. 300 million alveoli. It would be safe to say that a system like this would cut it down by one third to one half because of poor, poor portion activity. So that's a lot of lost alveoli. That's a lost drainage system, a lost support system, a lost gas exchange system. And I throw these numbers out because when we start talking about numbers these days, and you know, numbers pop up on the screens of TVs every day and on the radios, numbers. How many more have this COVID virus? I wonder how many more had the COVID virus and didn't do well because they had numbers that I'm talking about that were lost before they even acquired the bacteria or the virus. So I just, I think numbers are important. Those airways are influenced by the first and foremost, the position your chest is in and likes to stay in. The muscular pattern activity around your chest wall, your sight, your hearing, your occlusion, your feet, and your passions all influence those numbers. In the next few weeks, we want to make sure that we maximize those numbers, get those numbers up. So numbers that we're talking about on the TV and the radio can do what everybody go down. I firmly believe that. The bronchi of the airways continue to divide up until there are 23 generations of divisions. And I just went over those 23 divisions. In other words, every time you add another set of something onto that bronchial tree, that's one generation. The diameter of these airways become progressively small with each generation. You want the 23rd generation of those little sacs to exist. They gotta stay open because if the 23rd generation isn't staying open, uh, there's a lot of generations before that that are closed. The positions of the diaphragm generate generations. The position of the diaphragm and its range of movement and the airflow to these respiratory alveoli sacs vary when that chest wall posture and position is taxed, challenged, or taken away. Generations of airflow at those alveolar sacs is, then, is therefore controlled by how that chest wall performs in moving that lung, as we talked about about 50 minutes ago. It's got to expand, it's got to compress, it's got to slide and slip and move around. Here I non-manual techniques that are designed around diaphragmatic and chest wall positions are things that we're gonna hand out to you once in a while. We've got one that Jen's gonna to talk to you about as we close this session today. Take a look at it. It's a technique that uh, uh, I think most of us don't think about and I want you to look at it and you know, read it and we'll talk about it next time we get together. The average movement of the diaphragm during quiet respiration or with increased ventilatory ventilation is higher always on the right side than on the left. And that's a premise for all of our PRI techniques. Therefore, activities that empower the left diaphragm movement and ventilatory ability balances this human breathing body imbalance and promotes less overall breathing discord following a respiratory or pulmonary event or episode like we have with COVID. The greatest respiratory excursion during normal breathing occurs in supine. The greatest respiratory excursions during normal breathing occurs in supine. Supine is a gift, but so is other active, so is other positions. However, you got to remember, one has to remember that the lung volume decreases secondary to elevation of the position of the internal organs under that diaphragm when you lay on your side or lay on your back. So there's a give-take relationship here, but the greatest respiratory excursion for normal breathing occurs in supine. Your lung volume increases when you stand or sit. When you get in and out of a chair, your lung volume automatically is going to increase. In sideline, the lower chest has a higher excursion. 
and I would underline that because a lot of the peer activities we're going to talk about and have been talking about are sidelined. Our top 10, though, are centered around standing and upright for reasons we'll get into later on with this, with this uh, seminar, with this uh, series. Sideline allows the diaphragm on the lower side to rise further in the thorax than the do dome of the diaphragm on the other side. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about Notre Dame and its, uh, its uh, arches, those ribs, its arches, and how they support each other when you're on a sideline state or a sideline position later on in the series. This is one of the reasons why when, we put, when possible, PRI practitioners should consider left sideline non-manual techniques. And this is probably, I was telling Jen late, earlier today, this is actually a couple hours ago, this left sideline right apical expansion with passive right FA abduction, sideline number what, Jen? Seven. In intercostal. Uh, if you just lay there and just put your body in that position and do nothing else but just breathe, you're reportioning, you're recoiling, and you're balancing out this unevenness, that position, that position alone will help reportion activity that you probably don't have in your left posterior mediastinum and, or your left posterior lobes and your right apical anterior lobe. That activity by itself, just laying there. In this PRI webinar chest wall series, I will be therefore focusing on positional patterning of biomechanical chest wall activity. And I'm gonna emphasize biomechanical chest wall activity for all the reasons that we went over this, this afternoon. We'll talk about breathing retraining, chest mobilization that I really wanted to talk about years ago and I'm anxiously looking forward to it again with you. Postural and thoracic duct drainage, it's things that you probably didn't realize with some of these techniques that are existing, and maybe you're unaware of it. Positional rotation for, for prophylactic treatment of bacterial pneumonia using PRI guidelines. Looking forward to that webinar. Sensory awareness processing of regional chest wall and thoracic inhalation exhalation activities. Well, that was a fast one hour. I think, or, I think there's really nothing left that I probably need to add to that. I'm gonna share one thing, Jim, before I turn it back over to you. This morning I got a, or yesterday, I can't remember Louise. One of our faculty members, Louise, sent me this article. It's a research highlight article and it came out of nature.com. COVID-19 towards understanding of pathogenesis. It's not a long read, but it's, it's, it's highlighting research that's been, been done recently. And the, what I really caught my eye, Louise, was the very last sentence of this article. And so this afternoon and this morning when I put this talk together for you today, I kept this in mind. So everything you see that we're gonna be discussing in the webinar series on this chest wall biomechanics relates to this sentence. And I think it's important for us to remember, it should never have taken a virus to get us to this level where we start talking about things like lung again. It shouldn't have taken a virus to do that, but it did. And we anticipate more studies will need to be done to facilitate the development of specific therapeutics to control this virus. But here's the big one. We need, we need to, specific therapeutics to control or minimize pulmonary injury. And pulmonary injury does not have to come from a virus. Pulmonary injury comes from portions of your lungs that are not being used. You're injuring them. They're in a state of discord. They're dysfunctional. They're disease-like. They're disoriented. Uh, they need to be realigned, reportioned, and made re-evened again. Otherwise, we're going to be dealing with research that's going to look at it from, a, uh, from a, 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 some type of a medication that's going to fight this off. Uh, whether or not we have a vaccine or not, whether or not we have a perfect ventilator out there to put in your nose or your mouth, that's not the issue. The best ventilator we have is your rib cage, is your diaphragm are your extremities. That is the best ventilator you've got because that's the way God wanted flow to come up to the top, to the side, to the back, and back down again. And so I'm mindful of 
if you're going to optimize the immune system, we better have the best way to minimize this pulmonary injury that we're, we're presently seeing and have been seeing for a long time but didn't recognize it. I want to thank you for joining me this afternoon, this evening. I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you for coming and keep coming. I enjoy talking to you. If you get something out of this, let us know. Unfortunately, we can't answer all the questions, Jan, but maybe one or two. I don't know where you're at with time. Yeah, I didn't have any questions today. I actually turned off the chat feature today. Um, but we've been getting emails of questions and I see some hands raising, but um, we will get to questions, I promise. It just um, won't be tonight. Yeah, it won't be won't tonight, because tonight. tonight we just wanted to do an introduction and really give you guys kind of the basis of what we want to look for in this webinar. But trust me, we'll, we will make time for questions. And feel free to email them over too, um, because Ron will try to build some of those questions um, into our Absolutely. future discussions. Um, but one technique that you guys may have seen kind of on the intro screen here and on some of our advertising um, is the standing supported left glute push. And that is a great technique that almost puts you in a prone like position to assist the lungs with this compliance and this expansion and this perfusion and ventilation activity that we're going to be talking about. And um, we're not going to go through it in depth here, but I don't know if all of you guys have seen um, on our website. Um, we did a free privy episode we recorded a couple weeks ago and it posted yesterday. And we talked about a couple techniques that Ron broke down and went into further uh, reasoning on our website, on our blog. Um, we're gonna post his further reasoning behind this standing supported left loop push on our website tomorrow. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, and then I'm sure we will be talking about um, this technique more over the coming weeks as well. But it's kind of a sneak peek, this clinical reasoning that we're gonna post tomorrow uh, for you all. And also I noticed Ron's so used to teaching courses and talking to people that he kept telling you guys to underline, underline this, underline this. Ooh, and I realized you don't have it. Don't have it. Um, but it's really easy for me to get you these PowerPoint slides. So I will post those tomorrow as well. Um, we have a whole new webinars page on our website underneath resources where we will post this recording to. And I will also post these handouts. Um, and if possible in the future, I will try to post the handouts ahead of time so that you do, so that if you, you know, would like to, you can print them and underline and um, highlight. But I know awesome. it's hard for Ron. It's difficult for him to teach, to not teach, I guess, um, to talk without teaching. And um, so I wanted to make sure I will get you those handouts. But yeah, thanks again for joining us. We're looking forward to next week already. Um, and we hope you really enjoyed it. And like I said, if you have questions, feel free to email them over to me. Um, or um, our plans in the future is to um, hopefully spend the last 10 minutes or so um, going through questions as well. But have a great evening and thanks for joining us. Thanks, have a great evening.